here today. It's kind of really interesting. You're at a conversation and a discussion about burnout, which means you have a lot on your plate. You have a lot on your plate. You have a lot on your mind, but you took the time to hit pause, prioritize yourself and invest some time to really accelerate your success, to accelerate what you want for your career. So you are noticing signals within you. And I really want to make sure that we applaud that and that you continue to do that for yourself and as a leader within your organization and within your team, because it really matters. It's a big deal. We'll talk very specifically about that today. We'll be very mindful of your time and give you actionable tips and strategies to help you understand what's really going on with burnout. And um, so like Alicia mentioned, I have worked in the area of developing leaders and supporting C-suite leaders for over two decades, um, really positioning people in their best leadership qualities so that they are accelerating their career the way they want to without a lot of missteps, without a lot of stress is really the goal that I have in my life is to work with high achieving, ambitious individuals who have a tremendous amount of interest and potential to take care of their career, serve their organization, make it better. But also my dream and my goal is that the leaders that I work with, the professionals that I work with have the time, the wherewithal, the focus, the mental energy to really enjoy their life and give back to improving their neighborhood, their community, and the organizations by which they live and thrive so that those coming after us will also inherit beautiful organizations that have strong policies and strong culture that support amazing results, but without driving ourselves into the ground. So it's really, really critical that we think about that today. And that's what we're gonna be here to talk about. And I will share some of the work that I do specifically with my clients so that they can get results on how they take control of their time, of their thinking, of their emotions and their career so that they have a career that they love, that they really enjoy without the feeling of burnout. So they have gone from the pre-stages of taking on a lot, multitasking, feeling overwhelmed, being spread really thinly to then really focusing on their best strengths, using them to be seen and heard, take more risks so that they pay off in magnetizing better careers for themselves, more wealth, in their life personally and in their career in terms of their earnings and the work that they're doing. So we will get into that today. So for today's conversation, I wanna make sure that we talk about what burnout is and how it presents because it's critical for you to understand burnout as it comes in your life, as it shows up, not only for yourself, but as I mentioned, for your coworkers, for the teams you lead, for those around you. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. We're also gonna talk about why it's essential, why it's really critical for you to stop, like what you did today, acknowledge the burnout symptoms, the way that it shows up in your workplace and really hit the pause button on that. We are not, so I do have also a background in public health and management. What I want to make clear today is that we are talking about burnout and exhaustion that is controllable and understandable in the workplace, but we are not talking about severe or down the line medical depression. We're not talking about that for the purposes of this conversation, but that is not to say that I want to highly, highly suggested and implore you that if you or a coworker are experiencing severe signs of depression, please do make sure you pause and reach out to your primary care physician because it is very, very important that you take great care of yourself. You're very valuable. You mean a lot to your community and it's nothing we want to pass over. But for the conversation today, we're talking about workplace exhaustion and burnout. And truthfully, we are going to talk about some exciting 
new solutions. So a new definition of how to think about burnout and more importantly, really understanding what causes burnout in a way that we can impact change and control. So we are not going to be talking about the industries that cause our burnout. We're not going to be talking about that crazy boss that we can't deal with that is the bane of our existence, or even the fact that it's, it's our workplace. It's the workplace. You just don't understand. This is just how it is in my industry. This is how it is for doctors. This is how it is for lawyers. It's just this way when you're in upper management. We're not talking about that today. We're talking about what we see across all industries at all levels that is rooted in very similar patterns that we can recognize and change and start today. So the truth of the matter is burnout is ubiquitous. I was kind of joking because I can get like really luxury and academic speak. So I'm gonna try not to do any of that today, but it is seen in all industries at all levels. Deloitte did a research study that said that 79% of people are reporting chronic and significant stress, which is an indication and a precursor to burnout. So these numbers are rising, particularly as we are in our year moving into year two, year three of this worldwide pandemic. It's had so many changes and impacts and hits on our emotional and our personal and our work life. We all know that. And so we want to make sure that we understand that these never ending demands, activities on our and activities on our schedule, back to back to back scheduling on our schedule, meetings that cause us to have more work afterwards, multitasking, having too many and many, many projects, more than we feel that we can take care of in a day or week's time is a part of the issue, but it's also a part of our perception. We'll talk more about that. But this nonstop lifestyle we're creating for ourselves in our personal and our work life is creating people to report higher levels of burnout. Also the modern workforce, it is time. It's been very overdue to see what we see in terms of more women in the workforce and the diversity. And we are excited and welcoming of that. But at the same time, we have to pause and assess the fact that both men and women are having more and more on their plate. Responsibilities at work, responsibilities at home, which means we do need to care for ourselves. We do need to take rest, but we live in a go, 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 24 hour news cycle. We have our phones, we have our emails, social media. People are constantly able to reach us and we feel an urgency to respond. So we really want to understand what's driving our behavior. And that's where I work with my clients at a very, at a very significant level so that they understand the drivers, the beliefs that are causing them to then urgently respond back and feel like they have to be available at all times of night and day, which is leading more and more to the responsiveness and this lack of shutting off and disconnecting. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So we've got never ending to-do lists and schedules, outdated ways that we're dealing with the workforce and unchallenged expectations. So you probably, for those of you who filled out the survey, thank you so much for doing that. We wanted to make sure we tailored our conversation today. But common signs of burnout are that feeling of constantly being tired. You go to bed every night, you wake up, you're tired. On the weekends, you're tired. You're with your friends. You're not really feeling engaged. And actually, sometimes even social things feel like a burden. You got to get dressed up, hit the traffic, get in there. And you're like, I don't know maybe I should just stay home and watch Netflix. That feels like what I need, that maybe that's the self-care that I need. We'll talk more about that. That can also show up as irritability, frustration with yourself, with your coworkers, snapping at people, and then finding that that is like seeping into your desire to not really be around people, to not participate as much. So you're no longer doing as much of the things that you used to enjoy. 
But what you might find that you're doing, however, is unwanted eating, maybe what we call like buffering with food, drink, um, oftentimes, again, hiding away, watching television and overspending. What you're trying to do is entertain your brain. Your brain is kind of spinning and it's hoping that that dopamine hit will be the, the salvation to what you're experiencing. So it's this quick hit of something you really don't need. It crashes and then you feel terrible. You feel miserable and you're upset and then you start to beat yourself up. Sometimes we recognize that we do that, but sometimes we have no idea. And that internal self-criticism piles up, distracts and spins your brain and really distracts your ability to show up in a way where you're creating solutions and really coming up with new innovative ideas and being the leader and the contributor that you know you can be. How do we know? That, that this is a problem, that there are other root causes is because even if you take a break, I'm gonna go on a vacay, I'm gonna just get a pause, it's gonna be all better. You come back and like towards the end of it, you're like dreading it. You're like, oh my gosh, I gotta go back. So many emails, the schedule's gonna be the same. You start to freak out, there's a dread before coming back. This is how you know we have to deal with the root and this is just a simple sy symptom. So we will talk about that. It's very important to understand the differences between a symptom and what's really causing it. So why does burnout matter? So I work in the field of health, but I have a long background in the corporate world as well. But near and dear to me is community health and public health and making sure we understand that we have to take care of ourselves. But for high achieving leaders, what often causes burnout is the same thing that doesn't allow us to fix it. So we're seeing long-term levels of stress and cortisol and lack of sleep. A lot of times outstanding students, high achievers, we sacrifice health, taking care of ourselves at a root level, and we create behaviors that we think are correlated with our success, staying up really late. We think that more and more hours create success. We think that that's what's going to create financial long-term promotions and more money and better benefits and flexibility, but that's actually not the case. What we end up happening what we end up experiencing are strained relationships at work. We're like agitated by our coworkers. That boss, you know, better stay out of my way or he's going to get it. She's going to get it today if she just gets out of control a little bit. And then we, um, we also experience relationships slipping in our personal life. And we look around and we're like, okay, how did this happen? It feels like it's really out of control. And it has a detrimental effect on our heart health, our mental health, and our social and home, home care, home well-being. So what ultimately happens is we see a decrease in our creativity, our problem solving, our overall innovation and new ideas. It really impacts how we show up, our results, the reputation that we are developing for ourselves, the reputation and the dialogue that we have within our brain about ourselves. And truthfully, it really does impact your overall earning potential over the course of your lifetime. So this is why we want to make sure that we are not neglecting to understand what exhaustion and burnout that is controllable and solvable in simple ways and tweaks, what's really causing it so that we can get right at it. So what stops us from taking action to solving burnout? So we want to talk about the thought errors that high achievers tend, high performers, ambitious individuals tend to show up with. We have some kind of event or a series of events that happen that we start to think, oh my gosh, this is a little bit more than I bargained for. This is more than I can manage. This is going to take me down. We may not realize we've had a mental shift in our brain, and we end up thinking something along the lines of something must be wrong with me. 
everybody else seems to be handling it just fine. I mean, let's look at social media. It's perfect. Like everybody's got the hair and the looks and the parties and going on the cruises. So it really feels like they can do it. And then they're running in the morning and mowing their lawn. So it's got to be me. And the more we think that, we start to think, well, I'm a really successful person. Success matters to me. I don't want anybody to know I am struggling. I'm going to start to hide it. When I want to hide it, we do the opposite. We take on more. I can do it. Oh, I can do it. I'll be the one to do it. Volunteer. Sure, I'll do it more and more and more. We, we take on more than we can possibly manage, and we don't want anybody else to know. We also think, you know, in typical fashion, busy fashion, if I just ignore this, it'll go away. But we talked about the fact that you go on a vacation, you come back, it's still there. You change jobs, it's still there. You have a different boss, it's still there because of the way you're approaching the work, the way you've approached work to get to this level of success. So we want to make sure that we're making those tweaks and adjustments now so that you can take care of it at the root. And finally, you know, again, you have a busy life. So you think I'm getting burned out. You're taking on more and more. I'm too busy. And then you don't deal with it. You know, you don't stop because you think I'm too busy to pause. It's probably too hard to fix because I don't even know that I'm experiencing it. I'm clearly the only one. I don't know the root causes. We're going to clear all of that up today. You're going to know how to do it what's causing it, and how simple it is to fix it. And you can really start to enact some of these things. I encourage you to enact some of them starting today. Commit to making a change in how you guard your time. And then you can start to feel better in a few weeks permanently because you've addressed the root cause. So that is really why coaching can be so amazing is because we do not talk about the superficial things, the symptoms. We really get down to a specific situation and understand you in specific. So that that issue for you that may look different from your neighbor or your coworker is fixed, is addressed in a simple way, and you see the results, you see them improving, and it comes a different experience for you. So... I really wanted to make sure that we spoke about redefining burnout. And this is a new concept I wanna offer for you. And how I talk about burnout with my clients is that burnout is a state of being. Okay, that's why it doesn't go away just because you take a break or have a, 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 a girl's night or a, whatever, you know, a night out. It's created by emotions, your emotions, and your own perspective of workload and time. So it is a state of being about your emotions and how you perceive workload and time. Burnout is an experience. For simple purposes and how I talk about it, when we are addressing it with my clients, we go ahead and call it a feeling. We're gonna talk about some of the emotions that we might be spinning in, a spectrum of emotions that are typically extremely negative in the body. We're gonna talk about what those look like. Burnout is subjective. It's again, not a medical diagnosis, but it has extreme impact on mental health, mental wellness, and physical health. It should not be neglected by you, by your coworkers, by your team, or by your boss by your organization. And the other thing I wanna make sure I, I do emphasize is how we know that it's subjective is that there are people on your team, there are people with the same boss, there's people in other organizations and across the industry that do not feel burned out. So they are approaching it in a way where their success is how they want it without the strain, the stress and the overwork. So that's how we know, guys. So, so when you walk out of here today, you have to think about this as something you can fix and you can control. And that it's easy. It's simple. It's changing and understanding how you think 
about work and time and making powerful decisions by understanding what the emotions are trying to tell you versus ignoring it or suppressing it and just thinking it's going to go away. It's not going to go away. It'll exacerbate over time. And you'll get to really rethink and take control of your time. I like to think about you as, you know, being the safeguard of your time and of, you know, really a soldier, a gatekeeper of your calendar. We really want to get you in that space. So root causes we can fix now. These are the causes, some of the causes, the most salient causes that we'll talk about today. The first one is perfectionism. What you like to call your really high standard of work ethic. We are gonna break that down and debunk some of the problems that are causing you to stay in a state of constant burnout because of thinking and issues that are slowing you down. Perfectionism can also cause you to avoid getting things done. It can create procrastination. And then procrastination can create rumination. So when you're having all of that come together, you find yourself getting stuck. So we want to make sure that we don't find ourselves in that position, right? So what we do then is we solve it. I'll talk to you more about that. Another thing, let's see, the next thing that we talk about in burnout as a root cause that we'll cover today is really as high achievers, as people that have done really, really well intellectually in school, one of the things we have neglected, and we see this in all industries at all levels, and really in leadership, is that leadership is about emotions. Being a strong and differentiated leader when you lead humans, we're not talking, we're not tigers. We're not cats. We're not dog. We're humans. We have a prefrontal upper level thinking brain and we have emotions. So previous to this, like in the 80s and the 20s and the factory days, we thought about this as just get things done, get things done. Very mechanical, very industrial, very, you know, um, automated, but we're not machines. So the key to outstanding performance and differentiated unique leadership are your emotions. It is your powerhouse. This is one of my favorite things to coach on. And this is one of the differentiated. So I have a bunch of different management degrees. Nobody's talking about this. We tend to ignore this and it causes trouble. And we'll talk about why that is. I want you to think about emotions as critical messaging system for yourself. And in this case, these are internal warning systems that allow you to understand yourself better. And when you think of it that way, you take back control, you increase your control and your power center. Thank you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. And we're going to shift away from ignoring our emotions and not knowing what they mean to processing emotion at a deeper level. So we're not reacting, you know, getting really angry and just, you know, mouthing off to somebody in our personal world. Or maybe we bang out that email thinking nobody's going to notice that my tone is like on fire. Oh, they notice. They notice. Because what you do in one area of your life, you do in all areas of your life. So you think, and then, and then people are, they question you, well, you kind of, you look like you were a little upset. You know, you look like, and then you're like wondering how, I think I'm hiding it so well. You're not. And so we're going to go from ignoring or suppressing emotions and having them run the tracks in our brain to processing them in the body, which is what I do by teaching a powerful technique that you can master, and then you become in control of your emotional powerhouse. And finally, we debunk fallacies related to success, unchecked emotions that 
are built on from traditional conditioning about what success is, outdated thinking about success, success when we didn't have people that looked like us in a room, lots of women, lots of diversity, what we know creates better solutions. We need to bring our organizations and our cultures up to speed. It's out of date. That's why you feel so miserable because those things have not been challenged at an organizational level, but we're going to challenge that at an individual level so you can take control of the success in your life and make it feel better than what burnout feels like. And then finally, we are going to make sure that we eradicate ineffective approaches and thinking about work and time. And we are going to make sure that we deal with the unrecognized and habitual internal criticism that spins us out and zaps us from our genius, our true genius, our internal genius that's in you today. It's not like, I got to go get this certification. I have to go get this MBA. I have to, no. When we believe right now that what I have is valuable and there is a genius inside of me, there is art and beauty and creativity that exists. It's my turn. That's when it becomes unleashed. But we got to get away from exhaustion and burnout and get to neutrality first. That's the beauty. We don't have to get all the way to super duper crazy confidence, you know, rapping on the stage and going to mic night. We don't have to do that. We have to get to calm and neutral. And that's where the power really begins. So burnout issue number one, perfectionism. What's really happening there? What's happening is we're operating in A plus student mode. Call on me. I have the right answer. I'm never wrong. I'm perfect. We want that external validation. We're seeking that approval in every aspect of our life. So this can, we talk about this in terms of perfectionism. This can also come up as a significant issue, which should not be underestimated, but imposter syndrome. They say that imposter syndrome, the research and data show that imposter syndrome and perfectionism often is a result or results in minorities, people of color, females, because we are conditioned and taught to believe that we have to be perfect to speak up, to be seen, to say something. And so there are cultural structures and organizational structures which are outside of the scope of our conversation today, but we want to know that this is a real thing. And it can be addressed, but we want to tweak our perspective to create the success we are intended for. The next thing is when you have an A plus student approach, it's really unnecessary to have like something that looks really, really perfect. We, we want products to look really perfect, but if there's no conceptual value added, that doesn't really work in industry. That doesn't work in organizations. <clears throat> that may have been how we were trained as a student, but we want to move away from that. We're adults now. And even when we're in an MBA program or a law program or a medical program, it can be argued, is that the only determinant of success? And we know that grades are not, right? So we want to recognize we're no longer trying to go for A+. Plus. It's, really it's really unrealistic expectations so if you have this, well, this is just my work ethic. This is just the standard of, of what I do. I don't want my name to be associated with. That is causing you to work harder than necessary. It's not 80 for the 20, which is my favorite thing ever. 80%, 20% of the work to get 80% of the results. Go, let's go. Let's get things done. This is about progress. It's really unsustainable to try to be perfect. Who's perfect? It's who knows somebody that's perfect? Your neighbor, maybe the person, the person on, <laughs> the person on, on Instagram. No, you know how many hours they spent to look like that? It's a waste of time. I think it's a waste of time. So we're hiding behind perfect work. Really, and Dr. Brown, Brene Brown has so much work on 
how vulnerability is a key determination of success and of amazing leadership. So um, there is that conversation to be had. You're missing out on great opportunities to develop your expertise, to develop your own vision, to be seen, to be pulled into better roles, to be promoted and to get that next title when you're focused on, did I put a period after this? Is that a typo? Did anybody see that? Let's go, let's get things done. Let's not focus on that. And remember it's unquestioned conditioned response. You just have a low awareness about that. Something I have to work on all the time. The first thing I sent to Alicia, had a bunch of typos on it because I'm working on not caring about typos. And I had to send her an email, hey, Alicia, there's some typos. Will you fix that for me? And she's like, I'll do that for you. You know, I just asked. And you know what? If you didn't show up because I didn't have a comma, not my problem, really. So that's how we get to think. We get to think differently. We develop, in this case, we have a low sense of self-trust. And then in the next phase, when we get to progress focus, the after model, we focus on gains. We develop and operate from a true expert self-concept. I know enough. I'm talented enough. What I have to say matters. I'm working with one of my favorite clients, and this is one of his areas of development. He does not want to speak in public. So I texted him this morning, guess what I'm doing? I'm speaking in public. And he's like, actually, I'm doing it next week and the week afterwards because we're working on it. It was literally stopping him in his tracks, but he's a senior level VP of his organization. Speaking in front of people is really important. And he is learning to do that. You show up then in high energy and ready to be seen and ready to be heard because you're compelled to share the value that you have inside of you. You're not worried about the typo and the comma. You're ready to go. What we do here is we develop a new concept of B minus performance. For high achievers in the fields I work with, this is like really startling to hear. I can see your faces are like, what is this lady talking about? This is what we do. This is how you get more gain with less work. I challenge my people, let's get you to 25 hours. Let's get you to 25 hours out of a 40 hour work week. Now granted, they're already working 60 hours or 50 hours, but when you have that concept, when you're reducing the amount of hours, but increasing your results, your productivity, your efficiency, and your focus, you're quadrupling, sometimes six Xing the work that you're doing. You get more done than any of your coworkers in less time. And that's how that happens. You're spending less time on research, comparison. That's what that is. And you're in a high level of flow genius flow, your best work, and you are working in creativity, execution, and then you evaluate from a really powerful space for improvement, make things better. And this is working in a high self-trust model. So that's different from the first one. I have to do that. So the second issue with burnout that we want to talk about today is ignoring emotional SOS. And why does that happen? This is because we just have a low awareness, what we talked about. We do not learn and master the idea that as humans with our prefrontal cortex that sits on top of our lower brain, the prefrontal cortex is in charge of goals, decision-making, and our future. And we need to really flex that part of our brain and those neural pathways, and we don't. What we don't realize is the thoughts that we have we create. They didn't just land there, they happened. It could have been because of conditioning, upbringing. We create our own thoughts. Those thoughts create our emotions and that's the powerhouse. Because when you stop and pause and understand that, you can start to control the emotions. We need you to do that. We need to be dropping into the body and understanding this is not something to be ignored. As I mentioned earlier, burnout is an SOS indicator. It is not a cause for shame or blame. 
it is often characterized by emotions that feel terrible. And there's a reason why it's like your pain, internal body response. It's like a pain, physical response. This is your internal mental response. And that's that chronic feeling of stress, overwhelm, anxiety, worry, panic, and just really feeling deflated. When you spin in those spectrum of emotions, you're basically feeling burnout. That can lead to anger, resentment, hopelessness, and helplessness if left unchecked. So what do we do? The answer to ignoring that emotional SOS of burnout is to process our emotions. So what that is, is we develop a high awareness of the power of our emotions. We understand that burnout is an opportunity to rebuild your relationship with yourself from a place of compassion, from no judgment, and from a place of deep personal acceptance. This is often missing with a lot of people that have spent their whole life achieving, but not accepting, not celebrating, and not enjoying. We've looked for external validation for so long, we don't even know what it feels like to celebrate and be pleased with exactly where we are with who we are. So this is an, an incredibly essential part to authentic and amazing, outstanding and daring leadership. What we do is we cultivate a place of awareness, a deep level of understanding, and then we get to work making changes, making better decisions, guarding on our time. We understand the true cause of our emotions by asking this important question. So I'm gonna read it to you, so write it down, but you can always, you will have access to me after this. I do wanna be a community resource, so don't worry about that. Don't worry about taking too many notes. But this, you wanna ask yourself this when you're feeling particularly stressed out, overwhelmed, angry. What negative thought is at the root of this feeling right now? You wanna make sure that you get to that. You want to start to really acknowledge and honor the emotion that you're feeling in your body. You no longer want to just ignore it, suppress it, think it'll go away. It won't. It'll emerge like a beach ball that's been suppressed in the water. So the third one we talk about is this negative perception of work and time. And the current situation is that we're just being really, really reactive with our time. Loosey goosey, willy nilly, anybody can get on our calendar. We don't ask a lot of questions. We don't push back. We don't ask for a lot of, of um, we don't ask for agenda or an itinerary or outcome of the meeting that we're about to have. I say no, 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 no to all of that. Absolutely not. We wanna be really accessible, but accessible doesn't mean people steal away your time. Your time is your number one resource. You can make a lot more money and you will, over the course of your career, especially if you do these things, but you will never, you cannot make time out of like putting two sticks together. It doesn't happen. You must guard and shield your time. What you do here is if you think about the fact that the perception of overwork comes from that combination of I have too much work and not enough time to do it. And so we think that time and workload decisions are external to me. Well, my boss decides that. Somebody else decides that. My team told me, but why aren't you pushing back? Why aren't you making a suggestion? Meetings should be like this. Meetings should be 45 minutes and the result should be this. And we should, why are we not pushing back? We uncover those reasons and put together a plan that actually works for you. If you think to yourself, it just takes, yeah, it just takes a long time it just takes a long time. It just takes a lot of time to be successful in my industry. You're going to be doing this for the next 20 years. You won't change if that's the thought you hold on this. Also, if you have a very low threshold for failures, mistakes, and trying without knowing, then you're going to be spending a lot of time in upfront research and co comparison and contemplation without getting things done. Notice if you also are a people pleaser, you're gonna be accepting a lot, saying a lot of yeses and not able to get a lot done. That's how these things contribute to burnout and exhaustion in the work workplace.
So what we want to do to solve the last one, negative perception of work and time, is really create a focused approach to time and be extremely proactive. And we do that by setting boundaries based on self values, where we're going, what we want to achieve. You gatekeep your own time like a soldier. You really understand and accept the discomfort of saying no. Sorry, I can't do that right now. I can't make it. I can't commit. Or to the boss, to the team. I can do that if this, this, and this, which one do you think should come off? And then you make an exchange for your time. It's your most valuable currency. You create a vision for your future that you love. And you use that vision and that plan as a decision-making filter for what you say yes to, what you start to dramatically and drastically cut out and say no to. That's, that's really fun, actually. And you take action from future success in the moment. You become the master gatekeeper for your time and for your calendar. No one else does. When you truly understand that, you have moved yourself into an incredible power position. You are now making every 15 minute increment. This is what I ask with my clients. We do a time audit. It can be really tedious. It's incredibly powerful. Is your 15 minute increments are your victory increment? Are your one hour, hour by hour, resulting to that promotion you want in one year? Is it creating the success you want in three years? If you want to be a director in three years, what are you doing every cycle, every hour to make sure that your results line up with your three year plan? That's how you make the success exactly what you want. Picture, picture that, and then you create that and you create a reputation for result excellence. Because like I said, you're doing less, but the quality of that goes through the roof and you're doing it in less time. So the results are amazing. So what you're gonna be operating then from energy and focus for a career that you love, a vision that you created, you're highly directed and calm and in control. You're living with boundaries on your time. No one else is deciding for you what's going on. You're doing that. You say no without guilt. You contribute at the highest level and work becomes your happy genius place of creativity and creation. You stand up for yourself. You wanna be seen and you're excited to be there. You have strong and enjoyable relationships at work and at home and ample and luxurious amounts of time to do what you want for your life in all areas. So you create a career and life that you cherish. You rise to the top. You love your success. You don't bemoan your job, your work, the things you're doing. And you really end up outperforming and standing out with less stress, less working hours, and less missteps. So that is what I have for you guys today. Um, I do have a QR code, but I think that you all will be getting, I send out tips and strategies and free trainings and webinars because it's very, very important to me to contribute back to my own community where I live. But please feel free to reach out to me. I'm sure Alicia and the team will make sure that you have that information. And I look forward to hearing from you. And I believe there will be some time for discussion and questions things that are stirred up for you, things that are coming up for you. What do you got? Hey, Amanda. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I think it's really important to make sure that you are developing a culture as a leader or you're participating in a culture where the results speak for themselves and stand for themselves. And so it's not this like idea of this, like I'm here for one hour, I can be gone for one hour. And if that is the case, you wanna have those conversations with your boss. You wanna say, hey, this is how I perceive my work ethic, what I try to deliver and the results I wanna have. But I mean, so really the question there is like, is my boss going to wonder what I'm doing when I'm gone? Like, I, I kind of see that that's 
that's at the root of that question. Is it going to be a problem that I'm gone for an hour and a half? The out of office message, first of all, I don't know if you need one. I don't know that I would ever say I'm gone for an hour and a half. Like I've earned to be here. I, I contribute at such a high level that my hour and a half isn't compared to, to anything else that I deliver. Like it, it's not even in question, but it's, it's interesting. You could say, you know, I'll be gone and I'll respond to this, but it sounds like, it sounds like there's an urgency underscoring that question that I have to be responsive at all times. But let's think about it. Like, was it 30 or 40 years ago? We didn't even have email. So what have we created for ourselves in a culture where, what do I put, you know, what do I do there? So really that person can develop that strength of trust, that muscle of saying, hey, I'm gonna be gone and I'm gonna back it up. If my boss asks me, my coworker asks me, I'll back it up. Or if it's a very collaborative organization, you just say, hey, I'm, I'm gonna be gone if you need me. I'll be getting back to it. But again, I really do question, it's an hour and a half that you're not there, I would imagine. Like what's really at the root of that? What's the problem? Yes. You mentioned earlier the 80-20 rule where you apply 20% of the effort for 80% of the results. I was wondering if you could give us an example either from your own experience or a client that you've worked with where what does like a hundred percent of their effort look like when they do that? And how do you yeah. go about deciding what's the like 80% of stuff that you're not going to do? Yeah. So it starts with a choice and a decision. And what I really like to teach with my clients is that once you've made a decision, like there were 75 things I could have talked to you about today. But when I came here, I'm like, I'm going to talk about three. It's going to be three and they're going to love it. It's going to be amazing. And then I make sure that my content is amazing, you know, and that's what I think. But so what you want to do is you want to think like there is a plethora of information you could give, but what is most critical for their decisions now? What's most actionable? So what you would do there, if you have 30 minutes, or let's say it's an hour, you spend 30 minutes giving the best information possible, jotting it all down, and putting it into a form that's for professional use. And you don't then ruminate over the layout. Is it pretty? Is it going to, and then get lost in your brain about, are they going to like it? Is it right? Is it not right? What you do is you do not throw yourself under the bus mentally, or at the end of the day, if there's a typo, or if somebody comes to you and says, well, you totally missed this. You say, okay, well, let's add it in. I'm not going to make it a problem, but I'm also not going to spend two hours on something that I can get done in 30 minutes for professional use. So we want to move away from, I'm being judged by every point on my test so that my teacher, like your boss doesn't want that either. Decision makers don't want that either. What they want is you to come in the office with conviction with an idea and a proposal and tell them why it would work and what the risks are, but why you still are supporting that idea. CEO I worked for in the beginning told me that. It's literally magic. It's a magic formula. From your, your discussion of the A plus versus B minus approach to decision making and, and management, uh, it, very valid. And uh, it's just, uh, I think the, the difference is that a B minus person is more willing to adjust fire, change his approach, and rely on his team. That he isn't the only yes, one. Whereas the A plus person, when they make a decision, they become inflexible. This has got to work. This is, this is the decision that is final. Yeah. And it, we must keep trying to make this work versus the B minus guy who says we're yeah. a team. I may have uh, I may have exaggerated this area and not enough on this area. Let's continue working on it. So it's a working effort as opposed to an individual effort where everything's on one guy's shoulder because he put it all there and he won't take anything off and won't share it. I love that so much. I, I think that is absolutely fabulous because it's iterations of getting it done 
for success. And sometimes that means adding things on later. Sometimes that means we take a risk and we try. I mean, failure is, is, has such a stigma to the word, but failure is how you grow and learn, try and change. So that's exactly right. You come in with this attitude of, I'm going to figure it out. At some point, we'll do it together. And you as a leader, as a teammate, get to come in and participate at that level. I love that. Thank you so much for offering that perspective. So anything else? Anything else that you're struggling with? Anything else that didn't land or did land that might be helpful? If not, time is of the essence. We have a couple minutes that are extra. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It's very valuable. Should I turn it off? <laughs> I didn't turn.